Thank you, Charles. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can I, at the outset, say a huge thank you to the Institute and for Biba for putting on this event and to you all for coming along. The vote we're facing in just under 12 months' time will probably be the most important political decision anybody in this room will be asked to make in their lifetimes. And therefore, I think it's great that we are having such a high level of informed debate right across the country uh, on the issues facing us. And I was very taken by the amount of thought and work that both uh, Owen and Steve put into their presentations and all the work that their organizations have done around this particular issue. I spend far too much of my time debating independence. This is the second uh, such event I've done this week. I did a debate on Tuesday evening for the Federation of Small Business in Stirling. And uh, I think we touched on quite a number of the issues that have been touched on already. I no doubt will come up in the question and answer session uh, later on. And I'm probably averaging two or three events per week. So I'll be very glad when the 19th of September next year comes round and I can start talking about something else. Um, but I, I, it's great you're having this debate and, and, and I hope you will engage with the questions uh, later on. The, the question in this referendum isn't whether Scotland could be an independent country. The question is whether Scotland should be an independent country. That's what we need to decide. Would leaving the United Kingdom be better or worse for Scotland? And what would it mean not just for us, but all the generations to come after us? Because this vote will not just be for us, it will affect Scotland for possibly centuries to come. I passionately believe that the best choice for our future is to remain a strong and proud nation whilst benefiting from the security and opportunity we can take advantage of as part of the larger United Kingdom. And I want to touch briefly in, in 10 minutes or so on, on three areas. First of all, the broader economic picture and broader arguments for the UK. Then look at the financial sector more generally. And finally, looking at the insurance sector specifically. I think we're better off in the United Kingdom. We can bring out the best of Scotland by working together across the UK. We have achieved so much together as uh, four nations coming together under one umbrella over the last 300 years. And working together in the future, we can achieve much more. Staying a part of the UK is in our best interest. Our companies ha ha have more customers, our young people have more opportunities, and we face less risk in an uncertain world. The pound is our currency. We don't have our interest rates set elsewhere, as is the case in the Eurozone. And while other small nations have been overwhelmed by the global crisis, and we don't hear much now about the arc of prosperity, prosperity we used to hear about uh, from the Yes campaign, we in the UK have been protected uh, from the worst by the strength in numbers uh, of 60 million people on these islands. Being part of the UK is good for jobs in Scotland. Scottish companies sell four times as much to the rest of the United Kingdom as we do to the rest of the world combined. It is by far our largest marketplace. As part of the UK, Scotland is a nation of 5 million people in a home market with more than 10 times that number of customers. 200,000 Scottish jobs depend on companies which sell pensions and mortgages, and as we've heard, 9 out of 10 of their customers are from the rest of the UK. Staying in the UK makes financial sense for Scotland. We get uh, the benefit of public spending that is £1,200 a year higher per head of population than the rest of the UK. We don't risk the budget uh, for Scottish schools and hospitals on the volatility of oil prices, which in an independent Scotland would make up between 10 and 20% uh, of the income stream. And of course, oil is vol volatile. So the difference between the year when the oil price was at its highest and when it was at its lowest is the entire budget of the National Health Service in Scotland. Now, the SNP will say, and I'm sure we'll hear this from, from John Swinney uh, in a few moments, they will say that Scotland today is a, in a better fiscal position than the UK as a whole. What they don't say is that that still leaves us with a £7 billion black hole in our current account. So the difference between the amount of money we take in taxation and the amount of money we currently spend is £7 billion. And what they don't say is that even on their own estimates, by 2016, the year in which we would become an independent country, if we voted for independence in 2014, that situation will have turned around and we will then be in a relatively worse position than the UK. So there is no money tree 
You know, there is no pot of gold sitting there to be spent if we vote for independence. It's just going to be as hard or probably harder if we do. And the last thing people need is more cost and more upheaval. If we voted to leave the UK, if people voted yes in the referendum in September next year, we've got just over 500 days before we set up a separate state. It's expected that Independence Day would be in the spring of 2016. So that's 500 days to deal with all the unanswered issues and all the issues that uh, uh, Owen and Steve mentioned in their presentations. What currency would we use? The SNP favour a, a, a monetary union with sterling. Others in the Yes Scotland campaign, like Dennis Canavan, its uh, chair, favour a separate Scottish currency. We don't know. What would uh, our interest rates be and who would set them? How would benefits and pensions be paid? How much would our national debt be and how would we pay it off? Without the detail on how independence would work, what it would cost us and where the money would come from, voting to leave the UK would be a huge leap into the unknown. So I think the best decision for Scotland is to vote for a better future working together and say no to the risk and uncertainty of separation. Let me look at the issues around the financial sector specifically. As Owen Kelly said, the, probably the most important factor is that we currently have a single domestic market in financial services across 60 million people in the whole UK. And 90% of the customers, of members of SFE in Scotland are the rest of the UK, and that's confirmed by the UK government Scotland analysis paper on financial services and banking. 89% of stocks and shares, uh, ISAs provided by Scottish firms, are sold to customers elsewhere in the UK. And UK firms are based, are based elsewhere, are important to people in Scotland. 70% of the pensions products bought by Scottish consumers were bought from firms based in the rest of the UK. So at present it's easy to provide services to customers in whichever part of the UK they're based, and that's highly advantageous both to firms based here and customers in the rest of the UK. Now we have this issue called the border effect, and Steve, Steve White touched on this in his contribution. Were Scotland to become independent, it would put an international border in the middle of financial transactions and between customers and their accounts. And we've got a lot of academic research done around this point, and the international experience shows us that borders reduce flows of goods, capital and labour, even where countries are members of single markets with low formal trade barriers. This phenomenon is known as the border effect. It's very obviously seen, if you look at the figures, when Czechoslovakia divided into two separate countries. And over time, there's been a very substantial reduction in the cross-border trade between the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And a very similar thing happened when the Republic of Ireland uh, left the UK in the 1920s. Expert analysis tells us the border is likely to reduce the level of real income in the Scottish economy by around 4% after 30 years, with the effect building over time, and that equates to £2,000 per household in Scotland. So it's a very significant and important issue. Now, as we've heard, there's currently a single regulatory framework covering the whole UK, and that position could not continue if Scotland were a separate country. And if we were a member of the EU, and of course that's a matter of debate, we'd have to have our own financial regulator. Financial services are designed around the tax and regulation system, and any divergence in this area would produce a significant border effect. For example, ISAs provide relief on income tax and capital gains tax levied by the UK government and therefore can only be sold to UK residents and UK taxpayers. But if we were a separate country, would it be possible for Scottish consumers to put their money into ISAs provided by UK banks or vice versa, even if an independent Scotland was to develop an equivalent scheme? Let me look at some issues around, specifically around the insurance industry, because I know that's of interest of people today. It's the largest industry in Europe, the UK uh, insurance industry. It's the largest in Europe, the third largest in the world, accounting for 7% of worldwide premium income. There are over 1,000 companies authorised to write general insurance business and over 3,000 professional insurance brokers distributing it. And over 300 insurers write long-term savings, pensions and protection products and it employs 290,000 people. General insurance represents 5% of all Scottish financial sector employment. The Scottish sector only totals 5% of all general insurance services in Great Britain, and there are no major general insurers headquartered 
in Scotland. Of course, we have a large number of firms with a significant presence here, such as Aviva and Prudential. Insurance products are designed to dovetail with and supplement the legal, regulatory and welfare systems. And at the moment, these are mostly reserved to the UK, allowing for universal insurance products to be fit for purpose, no matter which part of the UK the customer is in. And if we had two independent states, there would be inevitably be a divergence in these areas, potentially resulting in the need for separate products for the two markets. This would affect the economies of scale and the ability to diversify risk over a larger market for larger insurance firms. Insurance products are also based around the tax regime. So if Scotland became independent, there could be differences in this area. Insurance premium tax is a tax on general insurance premiums, which the insurer is responsible for accounting for and paying. There are two rates, a standard rate of 6% and a higher rate of 20% for travel insurance and some insurance for vehicles and domestic and electrical appliances. Most long-term insurance is exempted from IPT, as is reinsurance, insurance for commercial ships and aircraft, and insurance for commercial goods in international transit. Premiums for risk located outside the UK are also exempt, but they may liable, be, be liable to similar taxes imposed in other countries. So what firms and employers would need to consider is what they would need to pay and what they need to do in order to deal with any changes to the tax regime if Scotland became independent. It's probably easiest to illustrate this with a case study, which is the, the motor insurance industry, which is the largest uh, chunk of uh, insurance uh, in the UK. Gross written premiums of £9.5 billion in 2009. It's characterised as highly competitive but highly concentrated market with, uh, with I'm sure you know, very small profit margins. Interestingly, there is very little cross-border business in motor insurance in the EU, with 1.7% of premiums from companies set up via the rules of freedom of establishment and only 0.6% of premiums written through the three provision of services. So if you, even though we have a single market across the EU, the amount of cross-border trade is close to zero. The main obstacles to cross-border business are the need to establish a local presence in the market and the differences that exist in contract law in member states, which both add cost and risk to an industry with very tight profit margins. The legal rules on motor insurance are currently UK-wide, but Scottish independence would increase the likelihood of divergence. And even under our devolved system, road traffic law is in the main uh, reserved to Westminster, and for good reason. It preserves a single market across the UK. The UK currently has a minimum requirement of third-party insurance for drivers. But the option would be open to an independent Scotland to change the level or type of protection uh, which would be required. And the prospect of divergence would undoubtedly increase the cost for insurers operating in both a Scottish market and a continuing UK market, having to develop new products and added regulatory compliance. Now, the effect on the industry would be determined by the size, type and intentions of a firm. But it, it's reasonable to conclude insurers would, that wish to continue to access the whole of the current UK market would be met by higher costs and additional resources. And these additional costs could be a driver behind firms leaving the market as profit margins are very small. And evidence shows firms leaving the market due to lack of profitability. And the size of the new Scottish market of just 5 million people may not be cost effective for smaller and medium insurers and brokers based in the rest of the UK, which of course would potentially impact on the level of competition in motor insurance in Scotland. And of course, if costs go up as a result of uh, changes to the market and changes to the regulation, these are likely to be passed on to customers. So in summary, Mr Chairman, I think that we have a situation where the UK single market in financial services is heavily integrated and important to the sector. It is facilitated by the consistent regulation, legislation and taxation frameworks throughout the whole UK. And if Scotland became independent, these frameworks would likely diverge, creating two separate markets for financial services, impacting on the sector in a number of ways. Firstly, the creation of two markets would require firms to provide separate products for Scotland and the rest of the UK, and that would come at a cost to the industry. Secondly, firms would lose the economies of scale from operating on a UK-wide basis, which would increase costs. And finally, smaller and medium-sized firms would find it harder to access the UK-wide market as a result of the increasing costs and difficulties of working in two parallel and different regulatory jurisdictions. 
So the effect of independence for the insurance sector would be to add to the complexity, add to the regulation, and add to cost. I think it's not a gamble that's worth taking, and that's why I think we're better together staying in the United Kingdom.